Are we live? Are we here? We're here. It's time for the show. Dun, dun, dun. Blair will be joining us later. She is giving a presentation for her real job. I mean, yeah. Wait, what? Her job What's job. <laughs> side hustle. That's what we like. Her That's side nice. hustle. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. So Twist is here. We are very happy to be bringing you our weekly science stream mm-hmm. as we jump into broadcasting our podcast recording. And just remember that some of the things in the show tonight might not make it into the final podcast. So count yourself lucky in that you get to hear and see the whole thing. The other people, they won't get to. Ha ha ha, you're in on the secret. Hello everyone in the chat. I see you in there. While you're in the chat, while you're online here, tell your friends. See if they want to come join our fun stream for the night to talk about science. Justin, are you ready to do a show? Uh, yes. What would you like to do a show about? French fries. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> what is your favorite French fry? Okay, uh, that's a that's a, oh gosh, that's a tough question. Uh, it doesn't exist anymore. Oh, it was uh, it was the graduate and Davis. Uh, it was across from UC Davis. The Those graduate had the biggest, thickest. Fries. They were like potato wedges, uh, more than they were French fries, maybe, but they were really good. Anyway. I just had fries tonight from Super Deluxe, and I have to say, mm-hmm. very good French fries. Very good, very, very good French fries. Oh, no potatoes for R and Lore. Gaurav Sharma likes the Cajun spiced fries. Mmm, Wendy's from Grouchy, Gr- Grouchy Gamer. <sighs> All right, well, everyone, now that I've got you thinking about French fries, maybe we can start a science show. And like I said, Blair will be joining us later. She said she's going to jump on in here towards the end of the show, and you will not miss the animal corner and the fun that is in it because i do believe she's got legs spider legs not french fries yes okay so yes let's do this show thing okay ah starting the show one two three four beginning in three two this is twist this week in science episode number 836 recorded on wednesday august 4th 2021 do you give a hoot about science hey there i'm dr kiki and tonight on the show we are going to fill your head with microbes trade-offs and melting but first Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following program depicts actual things being studied in the actual world by actual scientists. While the rest of the world engages in misinformation, either for entertainment or human manipulation purposes, we offer you a conversation about science. Not a class, not a lecture, nothing you will be expected to remember, just a conversation based in reality. A place we can all imagine humans will one day live, despite all the evidence to the contrary. If you haven't been here before, welcome. If you have, welcome back. It's time for This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go. Good science to you, Kiki, and oh, that's right, Blair's not here yet. Yes, good science to you too, Justin and Blair, who will be joining us later, apparently. She's got other places to be tonight, but we're here to podcast, to talk about science. We've got all the science stories from the last week here to discuss with you because yeah as justin said this is a fun science conversation so let's get 
talking. I brought stories. What did I bring tonight? I have stories related to some of those microbes. I also have a sinkhole, red bodies, and parenthood. What did you bring, Justin? I also have a microbe story. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a segment that I, I think I introduced once or maybe twice, but then forgot about. It's the, did we really need a study for that segment? <laughs> I uh, always like those segments. It's like, do, yeah, really? Okay. Some, right. some of, so this is the Common thing sense, about the but segment. let's back it up with science. It's yeah. A, yeah, so the thing is, the segment is, uh, did we really? And then sometimes it's like, probably not. And then sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, maybe we did. Right? So it's mm -hmm. all, you never know. It's you a mixed bag know. segment. Uh, also, a, uh, something about a mass extinction on planet Earth and how Russia is melting. Oh, no. It's melting. Did somebody throw a bucket of water on the <laughs> Witch of the West? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and I would ask Blair what's in the animal corner, but she's not here. So I'll just let you know that there's some legs coming, some long legs that will be coming up in that animal corner, among other science newsy bits related to animals. So let's jump on into the show. And as we do, I want to remind you all that if you have not yet subscribed to This Week in Science, you can find us, look everywhere for This Week in Science twists. We are on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch, streaming weekly the live broadcast of the show, and our podcast is available all over. We're Twist Science on Instagram and on Twitter, and you can find our website at twists.org. Okay, it's time for the science. Let's dump, bump, 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 bump. I already have theme music. You don't have to oh, keep making oh, up your right. own. Right. Got to... <laughs> Sorry, just do the theme music things every once in a while. It just keeps me going. <laughs> sound effects. Who brought the sound effect, Kiki? I brought some competitive microbes to start off the show. Did you ever think that it could have been the competition between microbes and also maybe the length of the day that was related to the oxygen in our atmosphere? Did that ever cross your mind previously? No. No? <laughs> yeah, well, it crossed the minds of a few researchers who have been studying the question of where did all the oxygen come from in the Earth's atmosphere? We know there were a couple of oxygenation events throughout our billion, multi-billion year history, right? So these events, many of them, were related to cyanobacteria, blue-green algae, that uh, they grew within the waters of the planets, soaked up the energy of the sun, releasing oxygen as a byproduct of their metabolism. But were they just there? And how did it just come to happen that suddenly they put enough oxygen into the atmosphere so that there was enough oxygen for organisms that use oxygen as a source of energy? to start living and surviving on the surface of the Earth. These researchers were looking at a sinkhole in Lake Huron. So this sinkhole at the bottom of, the, of Lake Huron is covered, the bottom of it is covered with bacterial microbial mats. And there are a few different species of microbes down there. The dominant species, however, are sulfur eating. So they don't use sunlight at all and blue-green algae, cyanobacteria, that use the sun. And what seems to happen as these bacteria are existing on the bottom is that at night, when the sun goes away, the sulfur-eating bacteria start covering up the cyanobacteria. They grow and they're, because they are using all the energy of the sulfur that's bubbling up from the ground beneath the sinkhole as their energy source. They're dividing and multiplying and growing, and they're taking over until the sun comes out. And then the oxygen, the sunlight using bacteria start growing and releasing oxygen, and there's lots of oxygen that gets released. And so these researchers discovered this, and they've been looking at the bottom of this deep sinkhole because it's this wonderful model system for what they think the early Earth might have been like. And they also thought back, oh my gosh, the Earth 
was spinning a lot faster once upon a time. So there was less daylight necessarily. The length of the day was like six hours at a time. It was a completely Wait, yeah. So this? billions of years ago. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so <laughs> day length was completely different, much so wait, shorter. I'm just trying to get this, because I'm trying, this is very important. So, like, a work day would be, like, max four hours. <laughs> yeah, like, no, max two hours. Come on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so they would, have, they would have their sunlight work day for the cyanobacteria way back when, and it perhaps took... A, sh- a long period of time for these cyanobacteria to get enough oxygen or to get enough sunlight so that they could begin to grow and take over the extremophiles who, or the, the chemophiles who had been existing off of the sulfur as their energy source. And eventually the earth started slowing down and the day length became longer more consistent, and we had more sunlight and oxygenation events. So maybe it was the spinning of the, su- of the Earth in its orbit around the sun and how that changed through the geologic history of the planet that set the stage for the potential of the great oxygenation events to even occur. Hmm. Yeah. A very, very fun combination of things. Not just the bacteria at play, but also how much sun was available and when that sun was available and where. Looks to me like we have a Blair. She has oh, joined was, us. Hello. You made, you made it. Yeah. So happy We're to s- join. Yeah. We are so glappy. We're glappy. Are you glappy? We're so glappy yes. to have you here tonight yes. <laughs> to bring us the animal corner. We were just finishing up our first story. It's time for Justin to tell a story. What you got there, Justin? So last week uh, we talked a little about bees getting trained by caffeine to be better pollinators. Uh, but what about the flowers? How do we get flowers themselves to be better pollen producers? One way we could support the plant's natural abilities has been discovered by Sean Christensen of the UC Davis Department of Entomology and Nematology in the wonderful town of Davis, California. Christensen, uh, quoting here, we found out that certain bacteria in flowers, uh, acinetobacteria, or bacter, can send a chemical signal to pollen that hijacks its systems and tells it to open the door from the inside, releasing protein and nutrients for the bacteria. In terms of of potential significance, this bacteria can double the amount of protein released from pollen. So it's important for bacterial growth, but it also could be exploited by bees or other pollen consumers to get more nutrition from their food. In the study, they found that the bacteria induced a over five times greater pollen germination and 20 times greater pollen bursting than that of uninoculated pollen. There was also, they had uh, found uh, some nectar inhabiting yeast that they studied that neither produced nor hindered, benefited anything, had nothing to do with pollen uh, germination. So they conclude that the uh, uh, acinetobacter both specifically causes and benefits from inducing pollen germination and bursting. So now that we have this whole other, we have this whole other thing we can look at in farming in terms of what's uh, what's on my what what bacteria is present and in what uh, amounts and should we be seeding should we be spraying bacteria on plants instead of insecticides uh, to get more of these pollinators attracted to to come and do their job yeah I mean I want to know how could yeah can we not just how can we stimulate even more po- pollination when we have a decrease in pollinators? So if insects are dying, can we enhance the feed ability of flowers to find the pollinators they need? Yeah, can we feed them? Can we get the plants that that they are still being attracted to to feed them better? And if so, we'll have should have stronger, healthier insects, pollinators that are going around and pollinating more and keeping keeping this is 
This is one of those things too. It's like, uh, who cares about a bacteria and a bee? Actually, our entire food web <laughs> depends on them. Our entire food web is so critically dependent on pollinators in the state of California, which is the largest ag state in the United States. Uh, one of the largest food producing regions in the world. It's absolutely critical that we do everything possible to yeah, make sure so the it's, system is it's, intact. It's good bacteria. It's back. The bacteria need to be there to protect, I guess, to also fight off fungi that might be yeah. bad so for the flowers. The bacteria can are going to inhibitors. Uh, yeah. They can actually be pollination inhibitors. Uh, so so having a bacteria there to, to fight off that fungal uh, is absolutely I think. And this is also this is this is not something like weird out that is being added into nature. It's already present and they're finding it in nature. Uh, this is actually a sort of a microbiota of bees, this bacteria. It's because yeah. they're attracted to pollinators. This thing is on the pollen. Uh, so it's already in that system. Uh, but the idea is, yeah, you could actually enhance output of, of that pollen. It's good for the flowers, good for the bacteria, good for the bees. Good it's for good. people. Be good for people. Uh, we are all, it is microbial earth right it's just every <laughs> the yeah. microbial web is what is important blair are you ready to give a short story to us oh yeah i am oh Find yeah out, actually oh yeah <laughs> uh i want to tell you about daddy short legs <laughs> what okay. there's a dad I, I know that i've heard of a daddy long leg what's a yes. daddy short leg it's uh, something scientists created. Whoa! So anyway, it's not Halloween yet. Hold on. Yeah, uh, scientists shortened the legs of Daddy Longlegs and changed their functionality by tweaking their DNA expression. There was a reason for this, I will say, and it was to figure out which genes cause spider relatives to develop these crazy long legs. Makes them a Daddy Longlegs, and the researchers assembled. A draft genome of them, uh, Phalangium opilio. They looked at three genes that act as a blueprint for where various body parts should go. And then they used an RNA interface, a technique that reduces gene expression to knock down hundreds of developing embryos, th these specific genes. When they did so, six of eight legs were half their normal size. And they had transformed into short pedipalps, which are like limbs for food handling. And when the researchers knocked down a third developmental gene that they thought was to help build embryonic legs, they didn't turn into pedipalps, but they did get shorter. And they also lost their tarsomeres. What's a tarsomere, you ask? I'm so glad you asked. Because it is a set of about 100 knuckle-like joints that can wrap around sticks quote unquote, like a monkey's tail. <laughs> so basically um, they helped identify the genes or the gene groups that select for the use and the type of legs that they have and leg length. So this is also similar to other studies that have been done in fruit flies. And so this gives scientists an idea for how these crazy long legs evolved, if they know kind of the gene that it came from. So it maybe is interesting, but this is a good reminder of just, just because you could doesn't well, mean you should. But it's also short legs. But they're using RNA yeah. uh, to suppress a, a gene that mm -hmm. uh, in development. Like this yes. is like real time. Gina, this isn't, they didn't yeah. go in and edit the genes of the parents or the, the embryo and then have a next generation. They figured out which RNA can inhibit or, uh, yeah, stop the stop the mm -hmm. translation of an activity yeah. on the, like, that's, that's the really, in, uh, to me, amazing part of this is that that's a thing now. We can do real yeah. time. And is if you go forward, take this spider study now and zip us into the future that means they could actually potentially apply rna to defeat say a birth defect that they can tell is coming uh by modulating 
how that gene expression takes place in utero. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I think that's an important point is, you know, looking at these genes, which are, which are responsible for body form and which mm-hmm. go back to our, you know, the sponges, our last universal common ancestor, right? Which ones split off and led to spiders and their eight, eight limbs and which, which genes are responsible for humans and our, our fingers and our toes and how, yeah, how, how can we potentially use RNA in the future to control these things? What, how does RNA control the transcription and translation of this now? It, yeah. Arn Laura in the chat is saying, does this mean that we can make everyone tall now? No, Arn Laura. Mm-hmm. Nope. So, so what science, the plan, I'll, I'll just give it up. This plan that science has <laughs> for the future with the exploding populations and too many people with too few resources is actually we're going to make everyone much shorter. Mm-hmm. We're going to make everyone a maximum of three feet tall. Uh, that makes no sense. No one will be able to reach the cabinet above the refrigerator, well, that's Justin. That's because we'll make the cabinet smaller. And now your single your single story one bedroom apartment is a two story, uh, maybe three bedroom. Right. So it's. But it's, what it's about the Olympics, right. Justin? Right. We need they'll still take to place. The Olympics. The they'll just have guys. a height limit. You must be under this height to compete. Yes. And meanwhile, Garov wants to know. Um, what about the daddy partially long legs, or as I like to call them, the daddy medium legs? You could also get that done as well. But y- yes, this is a terrifying in in thought exercise, very interesting in actual scientific implications. Okay, and at, as we're ending this story, I just want to point out I had no idea daddy long legs could wrap their little legs around things like monkey paws or yeah, like so a monkey everyone, tail. This Sweet to dreams. me is mind blowing. Yeah. It's <laughs> gross. No clue. It's listen, I am both spider averse and a spider advocate. So I will be the first Daddy to... Long Legs are the best. I love yeah. Daddy Long Legs. Yeah. Come on. But also great. creepy. No, they're fantastic. <laughs> No, their daddy long legs are cool, but now I'm gonna be like, ooh, daddy monkey legs. This is very different. Ooh, long monkey le- daddy long monkey legs. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's better. No, I have no idea. Trending tomorrow? No. <laughs> All righty, let's move on to another story. Speaking of legs, no, we're not talking about legs anymore. I'm gonna talk about some. The discovery of some very red bodies. Not here on Earth, but in the asteroid belt. Where they shouldn't have been, because apparently objects with a reddish tinge or a reddish reflectance should be trans-Neptunian objects. So we have these delineations in our solar system related to where objects were when they were created. And the distance from the sun determines what stuff freezes. And so there are different places, like there's the snow line for water. It's where all the water freezes. There's the snow line for carbon dioxide. There's a snow line for other organics to freeze as it gets further and further and further away from the sun. And Red bodies are typically found out past Neptune. They formed super far away from the sun. Everything's frozen on them. Yet these objects, these two objects that have been discovered, 203 Pompeia and 269 Justitia, are super red. And they're, temp- they're basically somewhere that researchers did not expect to find them. So what they can think based on this, the implications are that when Jupiter moved at some point during the development of our solar system, it knocked things around. And the gravitational pull and gravitational forces of these movements of these big planets potentially jostled some of these trans-Neptunian object, objects and made them come in closer to, the, to Earth where they have taken up residence in the asteroid belt. And within the asteroid belt, this makes them a tantalizing target 
for exploring these objects to get evidence about the earliest stages of our solar system, but without having to go all the way out past Neptune. So we can explore some of these frozen organics. We can get samples potentially like we've gotten before from other asteroids and bring them back and potentially learn a lot about the early solar system and some of these objects that got stuck in an early developmental phase of the solar solar system. So potentially easier targets to go out and learn more about our solar system without having to travel as far away from home. So it would be less time, less money intensive, and we could learn a lot. So very red bodies. Right. Researchers are excited about them. That's a clever find. Yeah. You know, and, and where there are two, there are probably more. So uh, now that researchers are looking for this kind of a signature, potentially we will find more out in the asteroid belt as we continue looking. What else do you have, Justin? Uh, okay, this is the occasional uh, reoccurring segment called Did We Really Need a Study for That? study from the University of Kansas, published in the journal Appetite, finds food choices at all-you-can-eat buffet tied to weight gain. What? <laughs> so, while the immediate takeaway on the story is that choosing to eat... If you eat all eat, the french fries, then... Choosing to eat at an all-you-can-eat buffet is likely tied to weight gain, regardless of the yeah. choices you make after entering. <laughs> like, that's... Yeah. Uh, choosing to study people in an all-you-can-eat environment is likely to give you a view of people who aren't also making the wisest food choices. Mm -hmm. But the study actually has some nuance to it. The researchers took young participants without obesity to an all-you-can-eat buffet and recorded their food choices. The researchers measured their body composition before they went there. A year later, they measured body composition again, which you would think, but wait, have they been at the buffet for the whole yeah. year? Like, yeah, every day. No, they just went once, but they recorded what foods they were picking out. And then found correlations between what types of food they were putting on their plate during that one day visit and their body composition outcomes a year later. Participants who consumed a greater portion or proportion of carbohydrate foods and sodium. Everything had sodium. So the sodium just sort mm -hmm. of becomes noise. <laughs> it's, it's, everything had sodium in it. Like on hot, pretty high levels. But the uh, participants who consumed greater proportion of carbohydrate food in their buffet meals had significantly greater weight change and percent body fat change at the assessment a year later. The study found no significant body changes a year later for those in the buffet who ate high proportions of fat High energy, dense, and ultra processed foods. Researchers <laughs> believe that there's a uh, what they have a, uh, they're looking at here isn't necessarily something specific to the caloric uh, quantitation of those those foods that they were picking. Researchers believe that the weight gainers were choosing foods that triggered more of a reward system than the not weight uh, gaining group whose choices were more energy based had they had more of a physiological uh, hunger satisfaction uh, based on their foods than the the group who was picking the carbohydrate foods that tended to be more uh, more of a psychological reward an important factor right. the researchers also point out yeah. should we then that that becomes the trend what are you seeking food for like i need to get me a cliff bar i need some pro i need some energy to get through the day versus, oh, I need to get like a, a glazed cinnamon bun thing because that's really what like I'm, I'm craving. Like that's maybe the difference. Uh, one of the important factors that the researchers point out is that 90% of babies begin eating meals from adult plates, creating what they're calling sort of a cycle. Of a feedback loop. Food choices. So... So yeah. what they're talking about also is hyper palatable foods. So these are foods with like lots of sugars or uh, sodiums, um, things that are designed to trigger reward system. Uh, 
no manufactured baby food in the United States is in that hyper palatable category that would sort of trigger that. However, if the first thing they're eating beyond that is something that is designed to get an adult human palate uh, triggered, an award system triggered, which probably has been an increase over time of how insane that can uh, that can be. Uh, this is quoting Tara uh, Fazzino, assistant professor of psychology at KU. One important, uh, where is it? Hyper palatable foods have combinations of ingredients that can enhance a food's palatability and make foods rewarding properties artificially strong. If babies are consuming foods that are artificially higher rewarding at early uh, in infancy, this could essentially indicate that there's, there's to their system physio physiologically and to their brain that, hey, this is what food is supposed to taste like and this is how rewarding it's supposed to be. Our concern okay, okay, is, okay, okay, okay. But did, is that what they studied? She's like making this assumption. This is not oh. what the study was about. This is so, like, okay, babies, yeah. they're going to be learning this from the grown-ups. Of course they're learning this from the grown-ups, but she didn't do that in the study. So okay. She just so was like, my, hey, people make bad apologies. food choices and this my, relates to their bad their okay. So my inoculation. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. I 100% agree with you. That's a previous study that she did. Okay. okay so, so I so have, no, I, have so I didn't I didn't thing. articulate that uh, based on a previous study on yes you're okay. absolutely right but uh, she's covered because she did that she has done that okay uh, she has done that research yes I, I have one other thing I just want to mention is that you you talked about um, body composition mm -hmm. so is that BMI is that what that's about so I didn't... BMI is like really problematic yeah. I that I don't know. I don't. Yeah. I don't think. So they, I'm just they, curious. I don't what... know what uh, what the, all of the factors that they looked at for yeah. for assessing because uh, categorizing obesity, especially in children, is pretty hard. So okay. So the, hang on. Uh, it was. It was the other one was about what children are eating. Right. Yes. Uh, right. But like the older study, right? Like yes. when are they getting it? But this, for this newer one, they were young adults. body composition. The newer one is young adults. Earlier and then later. And a year later. Right. Of young adults. But, but so I'm just somewhere saying, in the 20s, I guess, is young adult. Body composition is... I'm, I'm just putting out a word of caution that mm -hmm. the whole... If, if they really are talking about BMI, which is what it sounds like... The whole foundation of BMI they, is very. They would have said BMI. So body composition. I don't know. It, it, I didn't look, but we could be talking about cholesterol levels. We could be talking about weight and height. They're, so, so yeah, body composition isn't cholesterol levels, but uh, they, if they're doing a study, perhaps they are actually measuring uh, total body fat to because mm -hmm. you can you can you can measure uh, body fat to body muscle composition and actually get at composition um and that is going to be different yeah, than just that BMI. Ridiculous right thing where you stand so, so on the, a thing and hold the two metal this, uh, like the electrical current tells you yes yeah, yeah. so one of the ways that you also measure body fat percentage which is also something that's recently been kind of called into question is the the little calipers where you go and you you pinch and they say okay it's you're you're this fat based on just pinching a piece of your body so it's, yes, I, all I'm saying, I'm not saying that this is all bunk. I'm saying that when we're talking about human obesity, there are lots of different terms for what that means and lots of different ways to measure that. And some of them are used historically with very little reason. Okay. And so that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying anything about this particular study. I just to, to throw that out there. According to the Google... Uh, body composition refers to the portion of fat you have relative to lean tissue. Muscles, yeah, and bones, they looked body, at water, the percent organs. of body fat change and weight change um, during the period of the study after one year. I'm and sorry, Larry, it it's to carbs. what they ate at this ad libitum There's no meal. defending them. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, listen, them. I'm not saying the carbs are not bad. I'm just saying, especially if you're talking about adolescence, too. Like These are in their 20s. Are those still adolescents? 
Yeah, that's what you said before. You said adolescence. But anyway. I did. Young adults. Yeah. I said young adults. Oh, young adults. Young okay. Adults. Which is also anyway. a ma- magnificent band. If you've never listened to the young adults, you should go find them. Anyway. I, my point stands potentially even more for that group because they're, the shape I, and distribution of weight changes in that group pr- very rapidly. And there's, I I just wanted to throw it out there as food for thought. I don't need to have a whole like. But no, that's, I think she's this, a psychologist I think studying food. At, it's a food for thought. It's absolutely it's food, food for, for thought. thought. That's exactly yeah. what the study was covering <laughs> and with the results that they found. I do think that the what they're trying to look at is the pattern. So it's going to a buffet and how do people respond to a buffet? Do they respond with this, what they're calling hedonic eating, where it's like this, I am fulfilling a psychological need, the reward aspect, which what they're suggesting could go on and lead to a problem because then you're not, you're not watching what you eat as carefully as you should. You're just rewarding yourself at any Mm -hmm. chance you get. So that will lead to potential weight gain versus going in and making choices, you know, actually picking and choosing and not just going for the, I want to feel really good from the carbs, which is what I do. I go to a buffet and I'm like, give me all the rolls. No, wow. Yes. See, I'm the opposite. I'm like, I, I need salad. to get my, I need to I get very like, I need to like fatten up for winter off of this. I need to go get all the roast beef yeah. and bacon and put yeah, it on my everybody plate. Everybody has different ways, but I think it's, it's an interesting way to get at this question of how do people respond to food and how does that potentially influence future weight gain? And how are we trained on this? And how are we yeah. trained on it? What is, is your, are you yeah. like a rat responding to a little lever that you have to press. Mm -hmm. I will eat the carbs, which I will. Give me the pie, the bread rolls. I'm going to eat them. Oh, yeah, and the butter. I like, and give me a whole thing of butter. I like that, too. Okay, but you know, everything in life is trade-offs. It's (laughs) always got a trade-off. There's always a trade-off there. Well, some researchers... um, just published their study in Nature Communications related to their work on a little molecule called CAMK2. CAM kinase 2. This is calcium uh, motor protein. And it's involved in a lot of muscle and these researchers at Johns Hopkins Medicine have determined from their work with mice and fruit flies that this is a molecule of trade-off that it gives the young that young vertebrates have evolved to have this cam kinase in place for fight or flight to go chase after chase after after prey to run away from predators to survive and be a success in life but because cam kinase is an oxidatively reductive molecule, it causes oxidation reactions. These oxidation reactions are what lead to many diseases of aging as we grow older. And so what they're thinking is that cam kinase 2 may be, or at least the effects the oxidation effects of cam kinase 2 may be targets for therapy as we grow older because this has the elevated cam kinase activity has been linked to tissue damage in heart failure, atrial fibrillation, cancer, lung, and neurodegenerative diseases. So Blair, we like our cam kinase, but we also maybe need to modulate our cam kinase as we get older so that you can survive Mm -hmm. longer Mm -hmm. you gotta live forever yes but it's one more one more molecule for the researchers to look at to see if we can live longer and they did Mm -hmm. discover that in mice and fruit flies that they messed around where where they messed around with the cam kinase 2 levels in these animals they were able to shorten the length of the animals and insects by increasing the cam cam kinase 2 activity. So when it's more active, they died younger. Hmm. And then when they decreased the activation of the cam cam kinase, they weren't, the 
the flies and the mice weren't able to climb as quickly. They weren't able to get food as, as quickly and get all the energy from it in the same way. But they lived a little bit longer as mm -hmm. well. So target, potentially. But we need it because it's good. It's in our muscles. It's, it's important. So how do, we ma how do we manage something that is really important to us and our survival, but that has a trade-off? Hmm. So does that mean like disease. exercise is bad? <laughs> yes, Justin. <laughs> no. No, exercise not at all. Not bad. Buffet is good. <laughs> yeah, exercise. This is what we're learning. Yeah. Thank you for joining I'm, us for Twist. There we go. The, the science is getting really. <laughs> I'm starting to really like the advice. Coming Drink out your of coffee. The eat your steak. That we yeah. It's great. <laughs> This is This Week in Science, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Science Fun. We hope that you are enjoying it and having fun. And if you are, please tell a friend. We're going to come on back right now with a little part of the show that we know and love to call Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. Wait, hold on. I started it and I didn't even have my thing on. Hold on. Blair's Animal Corner. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? Oh, I have a great story about garbage birds. What? Garbage birds, a.k.a. cockatoos. What? Sulfur-crested cockatoos. Why, Why would you them garbage birds? Yeah, they're really they're, pretty. What are you thinking? They're so pretty. They're so smart. <laughs> but they belong in the garbage. Or at least what? that's what they think. So <laughs> let me tell you why. In recent years... Cockatoos living in Sydney suburbs have figured out how to open household garbage cans, and they love it. They can eat all of the sandwiches, fish bones, fruit, garbage wrappers, whatever they want. They get to eat all of it, and it's so much easier than foraging for food, breaking open nuts. It's definitely, definitely preferred. And so uh, uh, this kind of, as far as they can tell, is just these, some of these cockatoos in Sydney in the suburbs, figured out how to open garbage cans. All of a sudden, the behavior started to spread. Birds in different because locations. It's smart. Yes. Started to open garbage cans all over Australia. Well, not exactly over all Australia. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But a bunch more areas. Cockatoos opening garbage cans. And so... Uh. A behavioral ecologist, Barbara Klump, at the Max Planck Institute of Animal Behavior, decided, I want to study this. Why? Because this is a an amazing opportunity to study a behavior from its origin. When we think about animal behavior, we can't travel back in time and figure out the first time that a cockatoo figured out how to open a nut. How to crack open a nut, right? We can't figure out the first time a New Caledonian crow figured out to use a, a stick to get grubs out of a hole in a tree. But now we have a very small group of birds that know how to open trash cans. And that behavior is currently spreading. So this is an amazing opportunity to see how behaviors spread in the animal kingdom. So what they did is through social media and a mailing list from organizations like the Royal Botanic Garden and other organizations that would be interested in the environment and nature and animals, they ran public surveys. So this is a citizen science project, essentially. This is in 2018 and 2019. And they asked if, they had, if people had seen this behavior, if so, when and where, how they were opening the trash cans, all this kind of stuff. Over 1,300 people responded. And then they were able to make a map to kind of see what was happening with these garbage birds. I'm going to keep calling them that because wow. they earned the title. And so before 2018, cockatoo dumpster diving had only been reported in three suburbs. By late 2019, 
44 suburbs out of the nearly 500 in the survey. And so that's a substantial growth. There's still a lot of space to go. So there's an expectation that this is going to continue to spread. And the spread had a pattern. It started near the three original suburbs and trailed off as they got farther and farther away from those suburbs. So very clearly these cockatoos are learning from each other in these three original areas. And then other cockatoos are learning from them or learning from them or learning from them. And it trails off as it kind of gets more and more diluted. In one neighborhood, it appeared to pop up on its own, but come on, birds can fly. So who knows, right? But, <laughs> but that does mean that that would be at least a new nexus point, right? That would be a new starting point for cockatoos to uh, break open trash cans. And so um, either they hit on it independently, which is what the, the researchers suggest, or as I might suggest, it may be perhaps a strong gust of wind <laughs> brought a bird <laughs> into a new area. But regardless, this is a new area for the garbage hunting to begin. There's also some anecdotal reports of it happening elsewhere in Australia. But anyway, th this is like a very rich area to potentially study. And so they, they then secondarily caught and marked 486 birds in garbage can opening hotspots. And then they filmed them. They filmed 160 successful dumpster dives wow. and they noted some common steps. So first they would lift the can's lid at the front corner with their bill. Then they held it slightly open and they'd waddle towards the hinges. And then finally they would flip up the lid suddenly so that it fell open and yielded the uh, the treasure bounty? trove that was the, bounty the sweet, of sweet bounty of the garbage buffet. See, it's all back to buffets. <laughs> and so um, what's interesting, though, is that different individuals had different techniques. Some held the handle of the lid. Others held the lid itself. Some held it with bill and foot. Others just used their bill. And the farther apart the dives were geographically, the more their techniques differed. Mm -hmm. So not only is just like, oh, garbage, that's a good idea. No, this is indicating that it's not just the knowledge that there's good stuff in the dumpster, but that it's actually the how is what's spreading. Yeah. So they call right. this and regional it's spreading and then having slight mutation to the method. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah, so regional subculture. So this is like we've talked about with dolphins, they use sponges to forage. And so, yes, so this is the idea that this is another situation where there is what you could consider animal culture developing based on foraging techniques. And so um, it, it's not new to think that animals might figure this out. And we know that parrots and citizens in general are extremely smart. So that's not too much of a surprise. But what's really cool is to be able to see this behavior spread and differentiate across Australia. And I hope that they keep up with this research because like I said before, this is like a golden opportunity. So rarely do you get to watch a behavior begin and yeah. spread throughout a community. Yeah. It, yeah. This is, yeah, it's the beginning of a new behavior. I wonder if other birds that are generalists like these sulfur crested cockatoos that come into contact with human civilization. So crows, ravens are very common. Pigeons, I'm not going to. I'm not really going to go very far with that one. But uh, a lot of the big brained birds that are generalists and in contact with human civilization, I wonder how many others are paying attention and might pick it up as well. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Kind of interesting thing is to think about if, if humans exist for another 10,000 years, 20,000 years, 30,000 years, and we continue to have the same garbage can design. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. can imagine like a little a bump or a little pad starting to form on the beak that's being used to sort of lift the, you yeah. know, this is how evolution starts. And what's sort of interesting then, it's not just, this is that, it's not just a random maybe mutation that's taking place. It's a, it's an activity. It's a pursuit of a certain type of food over and over and over and over again that then leads to those who are also pursuing it who have a little bit better, uh, better take 
uh, better ability to flip open the lid, getting yeah. more of their genes out into the thing. You'd be fun and to I'm watch sure, this later. though, I'm sure, though, that these cockatoos are creating a big mess. They're probably yes. like pulling stuff out of the garbage and throwing it all around. And so people are probably getting annoyed. And so we're, what we're going to see is Shut adaptation up. of the people. And mm -hmm. people are going to start making it harder. They're going to put latches and locks on the garbage cans, maybe make it a little harder for the cockatoos to get access to. And then the cockatoos, will they adapt in response mm -hmm. come back to this energy source? And bolt dun, dun, cutters yeah. and with this, an experiment this in things, action. Yeah, this is one of the things I was thinking about reading this story was like, oh man, it's very clear that Australia does not have raccoons because you could not <laughs> have trash cans this easy to open in the United States. It's funny you say that because literally this morning there was a raccoon out on my, uh, out, out of eating on the fence, eating uh, berries out of the neighbor's tree. Yeah. At, like, uh, eating berries out of a tree much, much cleaner than dumping do. over your trash. Is that what they're supposed yeah. to? Because it seemed like yeah. they're like, yeah, maybe they're maybe they're like, oh yeah, the birds are in the trash now, so we're gonna have to, yeah, we're gonna have to go back to berries. Mm -hmm. You got another story yeah. there, Blair? Yes, I do. Uh, it's a quickie but a goodie. So um, this is just a. It's a it's a very convoluted story, but it, basically just a, something that I wanted to bring up for us to talk about for a second. So um, this is a report on the fact that um, Save the Chimps, a sanctuary in Fort Pierce, Florida, has made history by allowing chimps to make their own NFTs. They they did the programming. No, <laughs> no, no. So th actually, Save the Chimps has been working for a long time with chimp artwork. They really like to paint, paint, um, paint supplies, paint brushes, paint and, and canvas are really common enrichment items for lots of animals, especially primates. They it's definitely uh, something that they enjoy to do. But um, Save the Chimps has used that as a fundraising opportunity. And now this is the first animal artwork, as far as I know, and this publication knows, of animal artwork as an NFT. So non-fungible tokens, which I could try to explain, but I don't fully understand what they are anyway. They're <laughs> made up <laughs> digital things that no one else can own and are therefore very expensive and are kept on a server. That's kind of what I understand. So anyway, really... <laughs> I like your explanation, Blair. It's not... It's not <laughs> completely inaccurate right so yeah. anyway the, the especially funny thing about this without me getting all into a tizzy about nfts is that the chips physically painted paintings and then they like scanned them into the internet <laughs> and made them into nfts so you could buy the paint but instead people are paying for the nfts but regardless the reason that this was brought up in the scientific community this week is that this reopens the long and complex debate and history of non-human animals and the art they create. Who owns it? Who benefits from it? Where does the money go? Is it actually art? Lots of questions. The thing it reminded me of was the selfie Famous selfie of a monkey, right? Right, where the monkey picked up the photographer's camera, took its own picture, probably on accident because it's just mm -hmm. picking up, but it was a picture, and thus, does the monkey own it? Mm -hmm. The monkey took the picture. Whose copyright is it? Yeah, yeah. Which, Which yeah. you know, it was smiling and it wasn't focused like perfectly. So True. I don't know. It was it was so a nice natural. The, the monkey's is, a natural. If animals don't have the ability to spend the money. <laughs> I so, don't quite under yeah. but it's should wait, we wait, treat wait, the uh, animals like children where you know children are managed by their parents mm -hmm. for acting or you know now there hopefully are some new laws coming into play for the social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram mm -hmm. where kids are being used for um financial financial reasons but same thing i mean if there's an organization that wants to raise money to save or can help conserve certain species of animals um is there is that i mean why not what are, what what are, what are the monkeys going to do with their art do they get angry when their art is taken away no no they don't care no, they made their art. No. they had fun they care more about the paintbrushes themselves being taken away because 
it's about the process, which is really what art's truly about, right? Is the process. No. As you would know as an artist, Blair. Yes. <laughs> hey, but uh, isn't also part of it then what we were talking about is like we would need to convince uh, the chimps to use money and to right. buy into that system. Yes. I just think it's yes. an unconvincing argument. <laughs> yeah, Money. I agree. I think that. So is this backed up by a stash of bananas somewhere? No, yeah. not at all. No. Yeah. yeah. Yes. The, so you own the picture of the banana, and no one else can own the picture of the banana. Do you see? Okay. So that's my. <laughs> it, I sell you, those. It gives you as a, a unique ownership. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the chimps are selling a digital a, image of a painting yeah. that they made. Yes. Yeah, I know. Okay, I know. But the there's chumps one are. and only that dim that digital yeah. image because yeah. it has been coded and linked to Ooh, this look sale. Look at Clay's work. That looks like a brain. There's no, only but, one. Wow. There but are not mean, multiple you're copies. There's only one, but I see it right there. <laughs> I can no, take but, a screenshot of it. <laughs> that, but that's not the one. <laughs> This is my problem. Regardless, yeah. the reason I brought it... It's only $25? Rag, rag that actually NFTs. looks like a deal. Oh, I like that. That one by Clay. I have, a picture, like a, I have a picture just, of the Mona Lisa. Just, uh, I mean, I yeah. took a picture of the Mona Lisa yeah. at the Louvre once upon a time. Yeah. So I own I, I own the Mona Lisa. No. Yeah, but the difference yeah. is if you actually own it, you can you can touch it and hold it. And it's, right. it's the resolutions better. It's whatever. NFTs... <laughs> I think they're dumb. Come at me. Regardless. <laughs> it's helping. It's it, if, if organizations yes. can use it as a way to fundraise and help their cause, is this a bad thing? I would love right. to hear from our audience yeah. and um, and hear what, uh, what others think about this topic. Yeah. Because, and I think yeah. ultimately that is the key, Kiki, exactly what you said. If somebody is benefiting from the artwork of an animal that animal should be benefiting in some way. So uh, the the thing that they came down to um, when they settled on the monkey selfie was a percentage of the profits went to conservation research for the, the rainforest or whatever. And so for these guys, these chimps are directly benefiting from this fundraising because it is fundraising for the place that they live. These are all rescue chimps that were either used in medical testing or were in um, the entertainment industry. And so they cannot be released into the wild. And so if the animal's betting, benefiting from it, I think that's great. I think that similarly, if you're just taking a picture of stuff or in the case of the photographer who's mm -hmm. the monkey took the picture, quote unquote, it's good form. It's good form to make sure if you are benefiting from wildlife that that wildlife benefits. I, yeah. I think that I think that the. I think the quotient here is the fact that these are celebrity chimps, <laughs> uh, basically, who are uh, being put to the forefront of the center as a fundraiser. It's not. I don't think we're in the in the point where we're going to have secret uh, warehouse of right. uh, deprived chimps pumping out artwork because people can't get enough chimp paintings in their lives. I don't. I don't. I don't think we have to be worried about this at all. <laughs> at, at this point, I, I do not. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's Absolutely. Fine. Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. You can buy an NFT painted by a chimp or you can adopt a manatee. I mean, there are all sorts of ways that you can help animals. Um, if that is a cause that you are interested in, there are many species around the world that can use our help. So on that, Blair, thank you for bringing up the interesting question of who owns it? Who gets to benefit from it? And once again, we'd love to hear from you. This is This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us for this episode. If you appreciate us coming to you every single week, please head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link. Once at Patreon, you can choose your level of support and receive gifts from us. In, 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 in return, yes, if I can get the words out, in return for your support. But, I mean, really, you keep getting twists every week when you support us. Choose your level, $10 and up. We will thank you by name at the end of the show. And I do hope that you head on over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link right now. Thank you for your support. Can't do this without you. 
All right. I mean, I would come back and say it's time for Justin to talk about science. But he seems to have disappeared. So I guess it's my turn. <laughs> I guess that's yeah. how it works. Yeah, Kiki by default. Go. <laughs> Kiki by default. How'd that work? Oh. All right, everyone. I have a couple of fun brain stories for you. I have brainy news, as I like to bring it. First, I want to talk about parenting in birds. We know that in mammals, there are certain compounds that are released that lead to parental behavior and parental care. Now, not all birds, reptiles, not all species care for their young in the way that we think of as parental care, like really doting on on the young and taking care of them. But beyond this, there are changes that can be induced by being sensitized in the presence of young. Those virgin individuals can be induced to have changes through transcriptomic ways where there are release of certain factors in your brain that allow different hormones to be released that change the way you respond to young individuals of your species. This happens in humans, this happens in mice, it happens in all sorts of mammals, but we really didn't know whether or not it happened in birds. And so published in Nature Scientific Reports this week, a couple of researchers, Patricia Lopez and Robert De Bruin, they wanted to look into this question in birds, and so they took a look at a domesticated species, Japanese quail. And they, the Japanese quail have been domesticated to the point that they have lost their ability to care for their young. They just lay eggs, and they don't pay attention to the legs any the legs. Don't pay attention to the eggs anymore because it's been bred out of them. However, when the Japanese quail are put into the presence of little baby quail, they start to have parental behaviors after a night spent with the young. And so these researchers wanted to know what happened, what's going on in the bird's brain. And they found that through sensitization, just basically getting a virgin bird together with a bunch of young baby birds overnight that uh, they had gene expression changes in the hypothalamus and th what's called the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. And one gene is called it, that was identified that was of interest to them is neurotensin. This is involved in maternal care in mammals. And the other is uricortin-3. And this is causally demonstrated from their abstract here, I'm quoting, to affect young-directed neglect and aggression in animals. And so their studies, they think what they're, what they're concluding from this is that it reflects core neural changes that can be associated with avian young-directed care independently of extensive hormonal stimulation, and uh, it opens new av avenues of research into understanding the neural basis of parental care in non-placental species. So it's just a fas fascinating story of how animals can come to be interested <laughs> in taking care of their young or uninterested in taking care of their young um, and why and when that happens. I just think it's really amazing that we bred it out of these birds, but then if we put them together with baby birds, they're like, oh, my brain is changing and now I must care for them. I will take care of the babies. And then they do. You can't, you can't deny the little baby <laughs> right but this i think i wonder how involved this is in um so these were not the parents right of the little baby birds mm -hmm. right so these are just like i said virgin birds being put together with the babies is this some of the it, are these some of the neural changes that take place when adoption happens so when mm -hmm. we have 
you know, we've seen various species take on the young of others in their social group when the when the parents have died. Um, and I wonder if these are the kinds of changes, if these are the kinds of of uh, neurotransmitters that that start becoming active and and uh, allowing animals that are not parents to suddenly start acting like parents. Yeah, I mean, that's also, this is a jump, but uh, you know how domestic animals, the babies are extra cute, and we always say that's to, like, spark uh, parental care, essentially, in, in, in us, most likely. But, but yeah, I, I wonder if there's something similar going on when you adopt a puppy or something, if it rewires your brain to care for this thing and, and to feel a certain way about it. Yeah, and so I mean, so many people do talk about them as being, you know, My your fur babies. babies. Your fur baby, yeah, and yeah. Are these the kinds of? Do you have a shift in your brain that's like this? This is you're going to take care of a baby now, and you need to have this these things active so that you're not aggressive, and so that you're caring, and so that you're you're giving them what they need. You have an emotional response when they act distressed. Mm hmm. Yeah. Oh, there's something wrong. I have to fix you. What can I do? Ah, yes. Ah, what else do we have? Also, in the brainy news, I also have <sighs> some sleepy How dare news. you? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> and it's not about yawning, but it yeah. is. it is to do with our need to sleep. So we all know sleep is important, right? You need yeah. to sleep. When yeah. you don't sleep, things start just going wrong, right? If you're not sleeping, suddenly you're like, ah, you start forgetting things. You're mm -hmm. clumsy. Like just things start going downhill pretty quickly. You're describing you what, my day today. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What these researchers at the University of Michigan have discovered and published in their latest study is that in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences have found that there is an actual shift in your brain when you do not sleep. They looked at neurons in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is an area of the brain responsible for navigation and also very important for consolidating your memories, taking in inform information, linking it all together and going, okay, we got to store this stuff somewhere in the brain. Okay, the hippocampus is active to help you remember things. All right, so they looked into the brain and looked at the interaction in hippocampal neuron activity, how things changed between sleeping and waking, and specifically at what's called phosphorylation of the S6 component of ribosomes. These are the ribosomes are little tiny organelles that help turn mRNA into proteins. So you can imagine, very important for protein, the pre creation of proteins that are going to be involved in memories and memory formation. They used mice for this study and of course because learning in mice it's all about fear they used a fear stimulus um, and when the mice were allowed to fall asleep following following the stimulus they saw that this S6 phosphorylation increased in the dentate gyrus portion of the hippocampus and this is the first part of the hippocampus where memory information starts to come in. Without sleep, what do you think happened to phosphorylation in S6? Stopped. Decreased all through the hippocampus. It was down. And the fear memory was disrupted. They did not remember the event that the fear stimulus, as well as the individual mice that were allowed to sleep. So, they, all, they wanted to know exactly what was going on there. They found that this whole process, there was increase in abundance of RNA transcripts that are present in interneurons expressing a neuropeptide called somatostatin, as well as an inhibitory neurotransmitter called GABA. 
the interneurons with GABA, if they're releasing that, then they are inhibiting surrounding neurons and inhibiting all that phosphorylation in the dentate gyrus in the hippocampus, slowing down firing, making less activity happen. And this is all happening because you are not sleeping. You need to go to sleep. You have to turn off your computer every once in a while. It needs a restart, right? Your brain (laughs) needs it. Your brain needs to turn off. Yeah, and if it doesn't get to turn off, it starts telling itself to turn off. It's like, I'm going to put the slowdown switch on. It's like, yeah. when you don't get sleep, get sleep. it's like, inhibit, inhibit. Why are you not asleep yet? Inhibit, inhibit. I don't want to remember things. I should be sleeping. Your brain is trying to tell you something. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I might be anthropomorphizing your brain just a little bit. Just there. a little. No, I feel like this is the internal conversation. I had three hours, I think, of sleep last night, which for me, for some people, they can function. No, it was not enough. It was very bad. Uh, and I had to do, yeah. So I, I'm going to, as soon as we're done, I'm going to go to sleep. I <laughs> hope you plan. do get a very good night's sleep so that you will have plenty of S6 phosphorylation yeah. in I your hippocampus. I didn't even know I was missing it, and mm. that was the problem, and now it's I know you. why it's I was tired it's this morning you. and couldn't remember anything. Mm. I didn't have enough uh, S6 stuff in my brain. Yeah, No S6, S6 phosphorylation. You don't have any of those memory transfer proteins. No memories or less memories, anyway. Memory formation inhibited in your hippocampus when you don't sleep. So, Justin... It's your turn to tell us a couple of stories. All right. uh, Do you remember what you wanted to talk about? No, I'm kidding. So, yeah, there was uh, 250 million years ago, um, much of the life on the planet uh, was dying. No. Yeah. It was an event that marked the end of the Permian period. 96% of the planet's marine species, 70% of land life, went extinct in a relatively short period of time. Largest extinction event in the history of the planet. Florida State University researchers, they looked at this. Uh, They published in Nature Geoscience. They found actually that there was a sudden spike and then subsequent drop in the ocean's oxygen content. Now, the drop in the oxygen content had sort of been known, but the spike of oxygen in the beginning of it was, was was a new finding. Uh, one of the things they say is that although ancient marine oxygen levels were on a downward trend ahead of the spike and remained low afterwards, it's on a very ge- geologically rapid shift back and forth. They think it happened over just a course of about uh, 10, uh, 10,000 years, something like this. So it's a, it's a very fast event that took place that changed oxygen levels. And sort of like you were describing that, that, uh, that, deep pond uh, thing where like the sunlight the sinkhole get in, the sinkhole where you could sort of see the alternate uh, alternating population shifts during you know, daytime and nighttime you know these massive shifts of oxygenation in, in the ocean may have been a big key driver to the mass extinction event one of the other things is they also know that there was a lot of volcanic activity uh, so this, uh, the lower oxygen levels, and then you have an, uh, t- the only reason I think is to be what you were talking about is that massive volcanic activity could have been a dimming event uh, for sunlight making it. Oh, absolutely. Right. So then yeah. there's a whole, there's a whole other reason. This Component. Yeah. So anyway, interesting uh, oxygen. It's uh, what uh, we all breathe and keeps us alive, but it's also uh, important for everything now on the planet. This is an older extinction event where, you know, you were talking about the red-green algae. Uh, we're producing uh, oxygen when most things probably were more like that sulfur, uh, sulfur eater. Like, there was a time when oxygen was a toxin to life on the planet. And, uh, and, the, and the red-green algae is producing so much oxygen... I think actually led to to an extinction event there for a lot of the critters that didn't like it. 
Also in the news here, glaciers and ice caps in two archipelagos of the Russian Arctic are losing, I like this, enough meltwater to fill nearly 5 million Olympic-sized swimming pools each year. Which is a scientific uh, quantification, by the way. It's, that's how they talk about large volumes of water as units of Olympic-sized swimming pools. Satellite data suggests that the amount of ice lost between 2010 and 2018 would put an area the size of the Netherlands seven feet underwater. They didn't do it in Rhode Island, which is unfortunate, because that's usually, that's an American. That's how we know. We usually do things in units of Rhode Island, not in units of Netherlands. But, okay. Uh, warming of the Arctic Ocean appears to play a key role in accelerating ice loss from two groups of islands that border the Kara Sea, researchers said. They use, uh, they relied quite heavily on satellite data, mostly because these are areas that are hard to access. They're up in that Arctic region. It's really cold, and there's not a whole lot of support services. Um, but yeah, they say thinning of the ice has already had a major impact on the stability of some of the region's glaciers and ice caps, which could further increase ice loss in the future. Mm. Apparently, there would be around 16 Rhode Islands in the Netherlands. So, oh, see, the Netherlands 16 is... Rhode Islands. See, now, now I can conceptualize. 15-ish, 15 to 16 Rhode Islands in now the Now I can actually conceptualize. <laughs> that Under seven feet of water? 15 yeah. Rhode Islands? Yeah. Under seven feet of water? That's pretty impressive. That's a lot of water. That's a lot of water. Now. Yeah. That's, but that's the story. Yeah, Russia's melting. It's not just it's not just Greenland. It's not just Antarctica. It's not just the, the caps in the Sierras. It's everywhere. It's happening everywhere. So this is the Russian Arctic. It's not Siberia. This isn't just the permafrost. This is this is frozen ice over land similar to our Arctic. Just on the other other part of the planet. Yeah. If it's ice, it's going to melt. <laughs> and if it's Arctic, it's Arctic. It doesn't matter whether it's United States Arctic or Russian yeah. Arctic. It doesn't matter. It's all n the, the far north. And it's melting because climate is changing. Climate change does not respect uh, lines drawn on maps. No, it, it absolutely <laughs> doesn't care. And, uh, yeah, we're going to... I mean, the last few weeks, because IPC stuff is IPCC stuff is happening, a lot of researchers are talking about climate change, and politicians are starting to are are discussing what we're going to do and how we're going to address things. But I mean, we're going to have to get ready for ice-free Arctic. We're going in Russian Arctic, mm -hmm. American Arctic. What are what is going to happen there? We're seeing plastics being discovered microplastics found in the arctic we are also if shipping increases in the arctic we're going to see further pollution through uh diesel oil gas if there is mining if there is further searching for fossil fuels in the arctic well, there's, Which is there's exactly why uh blair's <laughs> blair's coming. short blair's shortening uh, the story about shortening the legs of spiders needs to be implemented in humans to have smaller humans to use less resources so we'll just to give the planet some time to recover before we do it again. Yeah. We need a little bit of recovery. Please, everyone. <sighs> yes, well, we need critical thinking. I love your comment. Yeah, if there's fresh water coming from that, can we pipe it to California? <laughs> <laughs> The American West sure. could use it. It's a great solution. So, and, then, and, then, and then this is always the part where I have to point out that California still has plenty of fresh water for all of the people and for the rivers. And it's just when creek. you add in all the farming and the, the almonds. almonds. It, I'm really <laughs> upset it's with just, almonds. It's just the almonds. It's really it's just get rid of the almonds and we'll be fine. No, yeah. Can we just, I, I mean, is it inaccurate to blame it on the almonds? No. I just, I don't feel it like it is. It is not. <laughs> yeah, it, the, the whole thing when they're talking drought in California, California, like, personal people consuming water in California accounts for about 10 to 11% of, of the fresh water used in California. The other 90% is farming and industrial. Yeah. So, 
yeah, like they're telling people not to water their lawns when they could just be getting rid of some of the the almond fields that they built while during, the drought was build was building up. While the drought was up. already known yeah. and building, they were yes. they were opening more and more territory yeah. for almond growing. Which yeah. I and I, this is like my probably the number two thing I eat. Like I would go to the buffet and eat nothing but almonds if they were available. I love almonds. It's my it's oh, my favorite. You're food. a part of the problem. I see I how it is. I am the problem. No, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> saying that I'm not. I'm just saying, yeah. There's not really enough of a drought in California to be. So I have a I have a question as a possible solution. We are seeing artificial intelligence being used to find patterns in all sorts of things to find solutions for protein folding to find to solve complex problems in resource distribution people are using artificial intelligence to uh, work the stock market we're using artificial intelligence to identify cancers better than better than doctors can now can we develop artificial intelligence for complex systems to help us distribute our water. No. Would that be a good solution to this problem? Mm. So, so the thing is, uh, the thing is going to, uh, is going to spit out an answer. Yeah. And the answer isn't going to be liked by somebody who has yeah. a tremendous amount of money. And oh, then for the sure. answer yeah. isn't going anywhere. It's, I was going to say a, a similar thing and say that uh, we could also ask the AI to find the solution to climate change, but it's going to be to reduce our use of fossil fuels and no one's going to want to do that. So, Well, what I think, you know, that we could do is that we could tie this AI in to the AI that controls the stock markets and and bids in the stock, stock markets. And potentially, we could get the people with money to follow along with what the climate change and water distribution AI wants to do because it will affect the stock markets in such a way that it will take away all their money if they don't do what the AI wants. So there's, there's <laughs> absolutely, I 100%. We need 100%. a benevolent AI to rule everything. <laughs> yeah, this is, that's true. What um, could go but, wrong? There is always an argument for, and I 100% believe that you could change those levers of resource flow uh, and create a system that is working better for everyone. The problem, no matter how good the system or bad the system currently is, somebody's winning. And whoever is winning does not want change. Even if it could be a little bit better for them, but maybe it would be a lot better for a lot of other people. If you're winning the system of capitalism money thing <laughs> grab uh you don't you're not want gonna any... like yeah you're not gonna you're not like gonna the ai change. telling you what to do i get it right <sighs> yes. and that's who unfortunately holds undue power in the system of governance that we have that is fueled by that money this is like what we've been dealing with with climate change and now again with trying to get people vaccinated where we're like what if this person says it? Will you listen that? No. How about nope. what if this person? What if a robot? To- no. What if Paul McCartney? No. <laughs> what if? What if the president? No. What- so yes, I don't. I don't Blair, know what is the most popular that. owl? What What is the most the the superb owl? <laughs> <laughs> um, popular how? Who gives a hoot? Oh. True. I like the burrowing owl. I think burrowing owls yes. are very a adorable. A diurnal owl, of all things. Yes, <gasps> diurnal yes. owl. There's the barn <laughs> owl. Only owl in its family sounds like a dying banshee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's the great gray owl, the tallest <laughs> owl. There's the Eurasian eagle owl, the heaviest owl at a whopping five pounds. I think the Eurasian eagle owl is a pretty amazing yeah. owl. The I also really ancient... like the saw wet owl, which is saw like this wet. big. Yeah. It has yeah. that name because it sounds like you're wetting a saw. There's Rip. one that was a little ground owl that I think was in Greece, uh, but it was on all of their money. It was like one of the first uh, mass-produced pr- coins, and it's a, it's a little owl. 
Well, today is Owl Appreciation Day, so I hope everyone appre- appreciates a little owl today. Mm-hmm. And if anyone wants to send us their opinion on their favorite owl mm. or on their uh, whether or not you would listen to a benevolent AI, <laughs> <laughs> you know where to find us. Have we made it to the end of another episode? Yes. I think we might have. I think we might have made it. We might have made it to the end. We might have. And I think I might have shut my show notes up. What did I do there? Doesn't matter. I want to say thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. Thank you for watching, for listening, for being a part of this adventure, this science stream. And... I do want to say a very specific thank you to a few people who help out the show. Thank you to our moderators, everyone who moderates the chat a bit. You are absolutely helping us do these streams and make sure that we can maintain the community, the kind community online that we have. Thank you for doing that. Thank you, Fada, for help with show notes and show descriptions. Gord McLeod, thank you for your help in the chat rooms. Identity. Identity 4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for your assistance now in editing. It's very wonderful to get that help. And I definitely want to thank our Patreon sponsors. And I have to take just a moment because, of course, of course, the screen isn't sharing the way that I want it to right when I want it to. So let me change this really fast and hopefully... Rachel will edit this part out. uh, Eknap49, (laughs) Woodsy Owl. Yes, I am old enough to remember. Give a hoot, don't pollute. Absolutely. Best owl ever. Give a hoot about science, everybody. All right. Thank you to Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Filo- Figueroa, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Melanie Stegman, DeCramsta, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Andre Bissett, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard Chefstead, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Matty Perrin, Gaurav Sharma, Shubru, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredis 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Matt Bass, Joshua Fury, Sean and Nina Lamb, John, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflow, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Kevin Railsback, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Hey Arizona, Support Aaron, Lieberman for Governor, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul, Mallory Sutter, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Mountain Sloth, Jim Dupro, Sarah Chavez, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DePel, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul Disney, Patrick, no, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, Tony Steele, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, and Jason Roberts. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon, head over to twist.org and click the Patreon link. On next week's show. We will be back Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Hey, do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Maybe get in some multitasking, go for a nice run, do some dishes while you listen. Just search for This Week in Science wherever podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, you can get your friends to subscribe as well. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to the stories will be available on our website, www.twist.org, and you can sign up for our newsletter. You can also contact us directly, email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in that subject line, or your email will be spam-filtered into the mouth of a snowy owl. It will be partially digested in their gizzard, and then it will be coughed back up in the form of an owl pellet. And we still won't see it. Hey, if that doesn't sound appeasing, you can just uh, hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, 
please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science, it's the end of the world So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Cause this week's science is coming your way So everybody listen to what I say I use the scientific method for all that it's worth And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Science. This week in science This week in science this week in science, 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your views But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan If you listen to the science you may just get understand That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week in science is coming your way So everybody listen to everything we say And if you use our method instead of rolling a die We may rid the world of Toxoplasma Gandhi Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Science. This week in science This week in science This week in science 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 Science. Got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head Cause it's this week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science science. This week in science This week in science This week in science Science, 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 science This week in 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 science And we are in the after show, the after show, the after show, we are, we are, we are. Thank you for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. Thank you also for flying Twiss Airlines. Ah. We hope that you have enjoyed the sciencey skies. Knock, knock. Who's there, R and Lore? <laughs> Twist science. Knock, lock. Knock, knock. Owl. Owl who? I'm waiting. Yes, they do. <laughs> yes, uh, they, yes, they do. <laughs> that's a good one. Very good. Thank you, Arnlor. <laughs> I like 
I like I like knock knock jokes. They're especially cute when young children are trying to make them up and um, just don't understand the humor at all. And they're just funny. I could be somebody. I could be an AI voice. I could do that. You were a robot voice for Justin's radio show. I was. I've been a robot voice. Yeah. I still hey, want Justin. to bring that back. Uh, yeah. We got, My episode, we got, I'd we like lost you to. Time. We got the characters stolen a little bit by the Han Star Wars movie, but nobody watched that, thankfully, and we'll follow the, the character. <laughs> which which character? The L3? The, yeah, yeah. That was, she, it was, she was totally ripped off from huh. Jack Feedback. Totally, Betty totally Bott, taken from yours. Who is an android uh, rights activist. <laughs> and who does uh, liberate robots on occasion? Oh um, yeah, but uh, but isn't going to get and and even ends up running from the authorities by being incorporated into the spaceship. Mm-hmm. But then gets out again and has the whole rest of a story that you can follow. So yes, uh, yeah. So someday, someday we'll get back to that project. <laughs> Um, I think I don't know how to use Discord. <laughs> yeah, uh -oh. I've tried like several times. It doesn't work. I got it a notification work. that I got a message from somebody and now I can't, I can't see it. Up on the left hand side, if somebody sent you, if you have the, um, the sidebar open. Yeah. If uh, it'll show up as a little circle of somebody, mm -hmm. if they sent you a private message. Mm -hmm. And so then it just lied to me. <laughs> there are also, it looks like there might be something in the Blair's Animal Corner category. No, that was how the jaguar might save its ecosystem. CC Blair Baz from Fada. Yeah, no, I think I just got one that was like, hey, <laughs> jaguar. All right. Somebody in the, somebody in the right, chat Right, Gaurav, never if you ask that. Alexa, okay, let's Google that. <laughs> Wait a minute, where did Justin go? What what just happened? Did he just fully leave? Did he just out without saying goodnight? What just happened? That might be what just happened. <laughs> did we get Justin ghosted? What? I, mean, I know he was tired, but come on. That was that was rude. That was rude. Jeez. Oh man. Fada's tired and is going to bed. Good yeah. night, Fada. It is a Wednesday. We're all a bit midweek punchy. Indeed. Going through the things of the weeks. Oh, he's back. He didn't just ghost us. What happened? Uh, it's the, I, I don't know. I moved over <laughs> into the chat and it uh, kicked me out. It did. Here. Uh, Nord Prefect said you got eaten by an owl. <laughs> I'm going to put uh, something in the, in the private chat mm -hmm. that you can share to the not private chat. Oh, onto the, onto the chat chat? Yeah. Because uh, right. I don't have access to the chat chat. I can't talk to people in chat. Unless you go have... into Twitch or... Yeah. yeah so, Justin, yeah. the the episode I recorded on is fully lost, right? Fully lost. Fully that lost. Was, that was like yeah. eight hours of work. That's it was, crazy. We, it was tremendous recording session, uh, but the KDVS Studios uh, had a ghost static thing happening. And, yeah, it's all terrible. soundcloud.com I mean technology is so much better now that was almost 10 years ago we could record it without all going to KDVS now <laughs> yes this is true this is true it's no longer required so it's, it would no. actually be very easy to record it it, it would it, it would, would be the adventures of Jack feedback This was when drum and bass was a thing. Is it still? Jungle? Jungle? Hey, 
Okay, we're at best. An overbearing autopilot. Come on, Jax. Lighten up. As much as I like Betty as an autonomous android sidekick, I couldn't stand her just now. Close quarters on an interstellar interceptor is one thing. This was smothering. There is a Carlubian quadrium dealer set to meet you at a traveling hotel lobby. He hasn't given us a price quote, but the going rate looks like it's more quit bits than we have, so you'll need to negotiate. Just remember, whatever he says, do not agree to more than we have. I can handle it. The key is to not want what they're selling, to have somewhere else to be, and to be absolutely unsure about the value of what you're buying. I've negotiated before. I'm sure you have, Jack, but please be careful. Carlubians have a way of controlling negotiating expectations that hasn't been documented properly. I'll see. <laughs> and on it goes. The link has been shared. It does feel very 2003. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> Oh my gosh, someone in Discord just said like, well, I started buying masks again, and so they bought one of the mammoth masks today. Nice. Yeah, it's like two weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe, I don't, what is time? I was like, oh man, I'm never going to get to wear my fun masks again. <laughs> you were thinking that? Yeah. No. <laughs> no. It was just, I was just kind of like, oh man, like... It's. I used to have like I have like fifteen masks. So oh, I you're could, gonna like, be wearing them. Yeah, every yeah. day, forever, forever. Yeah. It's, oh, they, yeah. Just, Our just, Lord didn't stop wearing start, them. We have to start wearing them in the office again, even when we're just yeah. in a closed office, not open to the public, um, and everyone's vaccinated. We still have to wear them, which I totally yes. understand. I understand why, and I'm happy that it's happening. I just think it's very funny, and my workplace is not alone in this that everyone has put the train on the tracks to get back to work. And now as all these things are coming, that train has not slowed, stopped or left that track. Like people are still uh -oh. like, well, we said they're we're going back to, going work, to work. So we're going back to work. Oh shoot. We need to wear masks if we're not vaccinated. That's okay. We're still going back to, Oh, we need to wear masks. No matter. It's okay. We're still going back to work. It's like, Hey, is it alright? Is it alright if I uh, if I move my desk uh, a little further from the wall? I need to get my respirator in here. It's rather large. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's people are. I don't like saying that people are dumb. It brings me no joy to say this. People do not like reading the writing on the wall. Because Just, I got to tell you, the writing is on the wall right now. It says stay home for eight weeks and you won't ever have to deal with this <laughs> freaking wall again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're I, I, everyone is frustrated. I don't know anyone who's not frustrated, but yeah, it's yeah. I yeah. I just don't understand. To your point, Justin, I don't understand. Good, Eric Knapp. Why? Okay, we've recognized we messed up. It, okay, we they said right. we were gonna mess up. We messed up, but you know what? We're still going to keep moving towards reopening and returning to normal. <laughs> let me let me do my little bit of voice of reason thing. And voice I'll tell you, of reason. I'll tell you that People if, if we were just, if we like could uh, just stay home, have that cessation of bills for a minute, a little bit of unemployment if needed, whatever's to do. I don't think that there are any workers who would say, eh, eight weeks. I could I, I couldn't do that. That mm -hmm. would just be preposterous for me to take eight weeks off of my work job to go make the the country, the world safe and healthy again. <laughs> it tends to be like kind of we were discussing before, the people who are uh, winning at economy thing are the ones who don't want anything to change and or keep pushing that train. Mm -hmm. Even if there's not what's, one rail, that's plenty. We'll get there. What's like, interesting is that there's a there's a majority of the I think uh, millennial generation who do want to continue working from home. It's a majority of my generation, Gen X, which I'm interested. I'm this is fascinating to me. Are interested in going back to the offices. Mm -hmm. um, so this is I think it's a generational difference. Um, 
comfort maybe with office environment versus home environment. Um, Gen X are maybe starting to age out of having kids in the house and millennials <laughs> maybe have kids in the house right. more often now. Right. Um, so, so well, maybe, and the, it, cold, maybe, the, maybe the kids also, are a different age. Millennials I mean, that's, want hybrid. Yeah, That's yeah. what's happened in, in, in my workplace is everybody with like 10-year-old and up kids want to come back to work because their kids are <laughs> at home and they can handle themselves and they can't be productive uh, when their 10, 11, 12, 13 year old is around. Yeah. But the, the people with two year olds, three year olds, they have to be home because daycares still aren't fully open. It could be the kids. It could be the relationships too with spouses. You know, if you're a year or two into a relationship, eight weeks together, no interruptions might sound great. If you're 25 <laughs> years together, why don't I eight have Eight weeks of uninterrupted <laughs> time together? <laughs> Mm-hmm. I don't know. Maybe there's. Mm-hmm. You want your mom cave, your man cave, whatever, your own personal space. People do miss the social connections at work. It's very true. And people are tired of Zooming. People are, there's there's a lot. There's a lot of psychological uh, I, influence I at play with, with what we're doing. I some of my best friends on the planet uh, through an interface of audio and video. Uh at least once yeah. a week. You know, you talk, you talk about us? Uh, no, I meant somebody else. But yeah, oh, but no, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You're right. It applies here too. Oh. Yes, Blair. Oh. Uh. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's a very personal decision if you want to be at home or at work. But I, I think it's very funny. Garf was saying that um, his workplace did a poll and hybrid workplace won. Which is not surprising. Sure. They keep doing polls. But as to my knowledge, I have yet to see a workplace that did a poll and then actually made a decision based on the poll. The poll? <laughs> yeah. Like they do a poll hoping for something. And then they does it then they're like, Oh, you didn't pick what we wanted. So we're gonna we do wanted. the thing we wanted. Work- workplace <laughs> polls are to give you input. Yeah. Not output. No. Just input. <laughs> That's what they're for. We want everyone to have a chance to give input. Are we going to have a chance to give the output? No. No. <laughs> That's the. That's how it works. But some yeah. people feel like after the input, they're like, "Hey, I gave my input. Now they know. Now they really know. They probably maybe it's something's going to happen." So Shubru said something that we had that at that their work they had three new cases of COVID, but thanks to HIPAA, they don't know if they were vaxxed or not. That has That's I don't think that has HIPAA. anything to do with HIPAA. It's not HIPAA. It does That's, not. It's not HIPAA. HIPAA you is can hospitals sharing your information. Yeah, you can ask. You can ask yeah. whether or not people were vaccinated. That is mm-hmm. totally fine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that, yeah. you can when people make it use HIP- you yeah, can make people... it mandatory in your workplace. Okay. That, like, like, uh, it's not against HIPAA if somebody says they're a teacher, but I know they've gotten a series of vaccines. Like, I, it's because you have to to have that it's job to have that job. Yeah. So that's nothing. There's nothing HIPAA. I can't tell you what I do for a living because of HIPAA. That, that's ridiculous. Like, yeah. all, all that conversation is. No, that's that's all. If silly. they said, if they said, I can't tell you because of hippos. Yes, because of hippos. That that actually has some gravitas to it. I mean, it's. It. I was telling someone the other day because I've worked with animals my whole life. To this point, I have never had a job that did not require me to have a tetanus vaccine. Yes. Yeah. Because I've worked with animals, mm-hmm. so like, also, if I had ever chose to work with bats or with skunks, I would have had to get a rabies vaccine. That is required. Yeah, I had to do a TB. I had to make show mm-hmm. that yeah, I was TB uh, tuberculosis. I guess uh, mm-hmm. vaccinated to like go be the parent helper for a day at yeah. my kid's school. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's not. It's, no. It's, yeah, and kids are required to show a bunch of vaccinations to go to schools in most places. Yeah. yeah. Not Marin County, but otherwise. <laughs> Um, yeah, if, if somebody yeah. answers, Hannah is exactly right. Anyone who answers HIPAA when you ask if they are vaccinated, definitely not <laughs> vaccinated. Definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, anyway. 
Yeah. It's well, so technically workplaces I mean, at least in, in California right now, um, I think in definitely in the whole Bay Area, maybe in most of the the, the state, um, workplaces are needing to get vaccine status of their employees. And that's part of the reason why. So if you call in and you say you got a positive case, they know if you're vaccinated or not because the response is different. Yeah. But it shouldn't be. I mean, there should be... It, it, if somebody had has COVID, people who work with them should be informed that they were exposed, regardless of whether or not that person was vaccinated. Correct. Because here's the other thing that is also a huge part of the problem. The Delta variant d- is mm-hmm. a honey badger. <laughs> and the Lambda variant. Not the Lambda variant. Care. Honey badgers. Does not care. <sighs> can still spread asymptomatically between vaccinated people. Less often. Still less often. The percentage of individuals who are vaccinated, who are ending up in the hospital, it's still less. But But the idea that people have now Mm -hmm. that because I'm vaccinated, I'm done and everyone around me, then we're all done and we don't have to worry about anything anymore. I, I wish it were true. Gosh, we hoped it to be true. Layers of protection. It it's would like, have been true if everyone got vaccinated. It would have been true if nobody got vaccinated and we stayed home for eight weeks. Also Yes, that, that too. Also Layers that. of protection. Yes. One of the big questions right now that I am finding interesting is whether or not to start promoting booster shots among mm-hmm. the more privileged nations when there are still billions of people around the world who have not even had a single mm-hmm. vaccine yet. Well, and the thing that um, I was talking to Brian about the other day, because he was amongst some of the very first people in probably in all of California to get a vaccine, because he got one mm-hmm. in early December, right. um, that the majority of the population that we're talking about when we talk about boosters their vaccine is at most six months old, but his is eight months old. Right. <laughs> and so that's what, does what that I'm mean? really curious yeah. about for the booster is like, at what point are we going to decide, oh, shoot, you should get a booster after 10 months. The majority of the population might be fine, but the exact people on the line and he's seeing COVID patients again every night. Right. So like the exact people who are interacting with COVID on a daily basis are the ones who maybe should have already gotten them. <laughs> so this is why I'm like, I'm very interested. I feel like they need to figure this out quickly because so, the people yeah. most at risk are the farthest along yeah. on, so on keep, being yeah. a booster. Keep an yeah. eye out. The frontline uh, workers, yeah. A lot of play, play places are probably looking at this. I know UC Davis is currently uh, doing some research on the booster. So we should keep an eye out there to see what that research um Right. Yeah, there are going to be pilot studies, clinical trials Mm -hmm. and things. Yeah, that you could be involved if if you wanted to. Yeah. And yes, our and lore, we will need a new shot based on the new variants. Absolutely. And I believe that Pfizer and Moderna and the others are already looking at new formulations for new variants because Mm -hmm. what it's going to be is that the next booster you get Mm -hmm. won't necessarily be. I mean, maybe right now it'll just be, oh, a third jab of the same Pfizer mRNA. Or a second, if you're me. Or or if you got Johnson & Johnson, then maybe it's another Johnson & Johnson. Or it's another... I bet it's going to be a Pfizer or Moderna. Or you get Pfizer or Moderna. Yeah. Or at, yeah, AstraZeneca, whatever. But it could be, you know, any combination. But after that, the next, what they call booster, is just, it'll it'll be a different formulation. It'll be something slightly different to help with whatever is out. Kind of like the flu, just like whatever mm-hmm. has changed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which I think is part of the important messaging around this, too, that we all need to do is when we talk about a um, a COVID booster shot, talking about it like it's like it is the flu shot, which I know like mm-hmm. talking about COVID like it was the flu at the very beginning was a problem. But yeah. talking about it, reminding people what a flu shot is. A flu shot is for variants of influenza. Yes. That's exactly what this is. 
Yeah. This is going to be a, a COVID shot for variants of COVID. <sighs> yeah. I think what's going to be, what's going to happen, and somebody in the chat, what, where was it? Where was it? Uh, Rick Loveman saying that Lori Garrett said that the virus that viruses like COVID have never been solved by vaccine, claiming that quarantine is necessary, similar to Justin's eight weeks. And yeah, because it's airborne, it's going to be something that does rely on quarantine. Part of the reason a virus like COVID has never been solved by a vaccine is that we haven't had things like mRNA vaccines before where we've been, our you know, our vaccine technology has been coming along uh, slowly, but now, you know, hopefully in leaps and bounds, we develop, we'll develop it further. Um, but it's also because not everybody gets the vaccines because mm-hmm. people refuse vaccines because we need a large portion of the population to gain immunity or partial immunity to be able to block it from continuing to circulate in the populations and create more mutations. And so what's going to happen is because we're not doing that, there are going to be pockets. Gonna, it's going to mutate. mutate. There are going to be another variant. We're going to have to right. continue Which to follow is- it. Hopefully, what it'll end up, what will happen eventually is that maybe it won't be like the flu. Maybe eventually, because the flu really does shift and is seasonal. And so that gives there's like a time for the body to just forget all about the flu. And then the next year you have to get the new the new vaccine to be able to deal with the new variant but because covid might not i don't know hopefully enough people will get it Mm -hmm. which after being vaccinated even and that immunity will eventually i mean what's going to happen is that eventually we're going to get it you're going to get it i'm going to get it we're Mm -hmm. all going to get it eventually because we can't stay at home all the time we're we're going to learn to live with it hopefully vaccination will expand unfortunately infections will continue but that number is going to grow and grow and grow and hopefully eventually it's just something a bad a bad thing that we have to deal with but hopefully and eventually but it becomes a bunch of hope right that you made at the beginning of this of uh, the weighing the foregoing of booster to getting more population so we don't have pockets that are still being ravaged Uh, at that, you know, uh, and getting those doses out globally, yeah. As opposed to having the focus be on boosting, I think we should be able to do both. I I don't understand how a global effort can't get that done. Um, yeah. But I am also there sort of COVAX. waiting for the pivot Co- of the. Yeah. I'm sort of waiting for the pivot to take place uh, amongst the more xenophobic-minded Americans who are like America first. Okay, so you, you we should all get the vaccine. I don't want the vaccine. Wait a sec. How can you be both against sharing it with the world before the booster, but against getting the... It's the same way like, uh, oh. the news from the border. Immigrants with COVID are coming to the United States. But COVID's nothing to worry about. Like, it's yep. the same broadcast. <laughs> what are you, how do you... How is it even borders. possible <laughs> that your head does not explode from... <laughs> The the different directions. Yeah. You're anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It does have to be. It does have to be a global effort because just in the same way that the state of California, uh, state of California, was was doing better, while the states of Florida and Texas continued to increase to the point where they're like worse than what was the worst ever at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can't as a nation. Of even not traveling outside of the nation or shutting off the rest of the world, protected by mostly ocean, we can't overcome this with those pockets of a vector still out there. I mean, same if thing the in the global. Same if thing the globally. Isn't, a, isn't going to shut down international travel. I mean, maybe we could at least shut down travel to Florida. I, I have my whole life. <laughs> Florida and Texas are two places I've agreed never to step foot. Yeah. That's again diseases sorry. and climate change don't, don't respect care. borders. Yeah. And th- this is part this was always part of my complaint too, right? Is like, yeah, if you're if you don't shut down travel, then that border doesn't mean diddly. 
Like this whole idea that like, well, California's vaccines are great. It's also summer. And so people are coming from all over the United States to California as they do in the summer, especially after finally I can travel now. Mm -hmm. So like, it doesn't matter that California's vaccination rates are good. People are bringing COVID in here from all over. Bringing it in. I'm and we're exporting it. Disneyland. We're also we're exporting, exporting it. it. And, so, and yes, the, the, borders, the, summer, the borders don't mean anything. No, I thought for sure <sighs> that we were going to shut down state borders at some point in this mess, and we yeah. never did. But then, mm-hmm. but then there's the borders. But then because you're like, there's a pocket of people in, say, the neighboring town, who <laughs> also are refusing. Like it's it's that that uh, idea that we're of one mind in California is also never true. California is definitely not single minded. California no. is so, got it is a big so state with lots of opinions. Your next city <laughs> might be predominantly a very different opinion. Uh, your neighbor might be. Your you know it's like all of these like it's uh, it's the people everywhere are having uh, not getting on the same page is gonna be part of the problem. And in the summer at least. People can enjoy outdoor activities. Mm-hmm. It's it's when the winter hits. It's not that you know one of the reasons that the flu is seasonal is just because people are spending more time indoors. Indoors, yeah. Where and then it, the flu is kind of airborne-ish too. And yes. Hmm. Hmm. Ventilation. Uh, it's a big deal. Maybe fun fact. Fun fact. In ventilation. If you go to a mall in the summer, they've also got the air handlers on. Full blast to keep it a little cooler in there. If you go in the winter, they actually don't have heaters. They just stop circulating the air yeah, because the heat. human body heat is enough to make it a comfortable yeah. temperature. I'm really grossed out now. Okay. Go to the mall. Let's yeah. go to the mall. But I haven't been to a mall in a while. I'm not, do I don't go to exist? the mall. Do they, they do. still even exist? Mm-hmm. They okay. do. They sure do. I went a couple months ago. I spent a whole day at a mall. Gratchy Gamer says people are quickly leaving California. No, they're, they're not. not leaving California <laughs> no, not. as much we're as people getting... say. Yeah. Yeah. They're not really. No. We usually, we usually have, we have a lot of immigrants from all of the other states. Mm-hmm. Uh, that makes up for it. It's fine. <laughs> people come from other states here and then people leave here because they can't buy a house. <laughs> Yeah, that's basically it's a nice right. like little hopscotch, <laughs> little exchange. So Grouchy Gamer store. is bringing up us uh, public swimming pools and children with the letter P in the pool, um, putting the letter putting the letter P in the pools. Yeah, anywhere. Like I don't but care about I that. Feel, I feel like them. that's what Lollapalooza was. It was like Lollapalooza in Chicago. It's like you know there are all those. Little kids with COVID, and not little kids, young adults who went, who were like, oh, I'm bringing the COVID to Lollapalooza. Woo woo. Yeah. Can't wait for that data. Mm. Can't believe they're doing it. They There's did so it. many things. It's I'm done. Like, it was oh, yeah. crowded. I can't it, believe it. It looked terrifying. It looked terrifying, and I was glad I was home this weekend. <laughs> Yeah, I don't get it. I don't understand. I understand people don't want to cancel things again. I get it. But full capacity? Mm, I that's don't nice. get yeah. how they then dig in their heels and do whatever they want anyway. You can be bummed about it, but you still have to make the right choice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's Vaccinate wild. if you can. Wear your masks. Social distance. Because... The COVID honey badger is coming for you. I haven't seen anything Everybody's about like, oh. social distancing in months. Like they completely dropped the, those words and they never brought them back. This is what I was like. I was thinking about the other day. They're, they're talking about masks again, but nobody has brought social distancing back up, which I keep asking like, hey, so still no masks outside, right? And, and yes, the answer is still no masks outside. And I'm like, okay, but then... Should we be asking people to keep their distance? If you, I mean, if you, if it's, I don't know, if it's a small group, it's people you know, you're all vaccinated, you don't necessarily have to keep that much distance, but if you're going to a public thing right. at a park, maybe there's a music event or something, keep your distance, That's right? I mean, people the are distance. saying it and spraying it at every moment. 
the Just distance is the like distance. not part of the conversation anymore, which is why like capacity restrictions outside haven't changed uh. in the last couple weeks. Social distancing is out of the equation, and I don't understand why. This is 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 fascinating. It shouldn't be. As, and I, as much as I'm enjoying the conversation, physically dis I physically distinct distancing. Yes, go. you do. Go. You need to go That's do okay. some mental distancing and sleeping. <laughs> I'll I'll join you in some mental distancing. That sounds yes. Better. Three phosphorylation. Let's yes. all make it happen tonight, phosphate, everybody. Phosphate, Let's remember phosphate, some of this phosphate. stuff. Say goodnight, Blair. <laughs> Good night, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Good night, Justin. <gasps> Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful week. We will be back again with more science next week. Woo woo! Stay well. Stay safe. Wear a mask in public. Thank you for joining us for another episode. Have a good one. Good night.